We're delighted to be here and uh, to have another opportunity to be at this great church with a great pastor. I, you know, he kind of made a little introduction. You really need to know what really happened. <laughs> what really happened, I was here in 21. I was received so well. It was so nice. They fed me a nice dinner, gave me a great, great opportunity to come minister. So I wanted to come back. So I like called him and said, look, when can I come back? And he said, well, you have to understand, we had you here as a test run. And so you did okay. You did okay. You did okay. But Evans, you have to know, they're used to hearing me. And so, you know, while you okay, it's just not quite what we're looking for. So I was a little evangelically ticked off uh, with him telling me that. I said, please, Pastor Lou, let me let me come back. He said, send me a CD. Let me hear how you're coming along with your homiletical skills. So I, you know, I practiced a little bit. I sent him a CD. He listened to it. He said, you're definitely improving. You're improving. You're moving in the right direction. But you have to understand, this is, this is, this is a different kind of church, and you're just not ready yet. I said, Pastor, can I just get one more chance? He said, send me one more CD. So I sent him one more CD. I said, you know, let me know, let me know if, I'm, if, if I'm good enough to come back. He said, I listened to your CD, you're definitely working hard, but mm, I just don't think you're ready. I said, I'll come for free. He said, now you're ready. So I'm <laughs> delighted for this um, opportunity to be here. No, I'm just kidding. I am uh, grateful to be here. When my daughter Priscilla found out I was coming here, she was excited. And, uh, and we love, love your pastor and uh, the great work that you are that you are doing here and the series that you are embarking on, which I encourage you to take full advantage of related to hearing, hearing God. Some years ago in my home, I had a problem. I had a problem. There was a crack on my bedroom wall. There was a crack on my bedroom wall. I needed to get it repaired. I called a painter over to fix my problem. He came over. He removed the old plastic, put up new plastic. He painted over it. I was satisfied. I paid him. All looked well. He went home. A month later, however, the crack re reappeared, reappeared. So I'm a little bit peeved. I'd already paid him. I called him back. I said, look, my problem is back again. He looked at it, stared at it, and then he redid it. Took off the old plaster, which was now new plaster, put up even newer plaster, painted over. All seemed well. But about 45 days later, the cracks reappeared, this time with his nieces, nephews, uncles, aunts, and cousins. I had a whole family of cracks that had made himself at home on my bedroom wall. I figured I needed to get a new painter. So I called another guy over and I said, can you rectify, can you fix my problem? He looked up at the cracks on my wall and uh, he stared at it and stared at it and stared at it and stared at it. I, I said, can you fix this? He said, no, I, I'm, I, can't, I can't help you. I said, well, wait a minute, isn't this what you do? He said, yes, this is what I do, but I, but I can't help you. I said, why not? He said, because you don't have a problem with cracks on your wall. So I looked at the cracks on my wall that I was not having a problem with. <laughs> then I looked at the crack in front of me who was telling me I didn't have a problem with cracks on my wall. I said, now, wait a minute. I see a crack. You see a crack. All God's children see a crack. Oh, he said, there's a crack on your wall. I'm just saying that's not your problem. He says, your problem is you have a shifting foundation. The foundation under your house is moving. So what you're looking at on your wall are symptoms of a much deeper problem. He says, if you don't solidify a foundation, you will be ever be doing patchwork on cracks on your wall. And everywhere you look today, there are cracks in our lives, in our circumstances, in our worlds. And a lot of efforts are being put into patching things up, and perhaps for a temporary period of time, things may appear to be better. But at the foundation level, if things don't get stabilized there, then you live a life of patchwork rather than seeing things rectified. And this is why the voice of God is so important. Because we do not serve a patchwork God. We serve a God who wants to relate to us at the source level. So that when the cracks appear, and they do appear, we do not spend our time on a symptom while forsaking a cause. 
Jesus told a story at the end of the greatest sermon that was ever preached, of course, by the greatest preacher who ever pontificated. And he concludes his Sermon on the Mount at the end of Matthew chapter 7. It's a tale of two men who were listening to the voice of God. We're told in Matthew chapter 7, verse 24, Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and acts on them may be compared to a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rains fell and the floods came and the winds blew and slammed against that house and yet it did not fall for it had been founded on the rock. Everyone who hears these words of mine and does not act on them will be compared to a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rain fell, the floods came and the winds blew and slammed against that house and it fell and great was its fall. In the, this short story we have a comparison, a contrast, and a conclusion. And it is in understanding this comparison, contrast, and conclusion, you can determine uh, which man, which person you are relative to hearing the voice of God. First of all, let's compare these two people. They had the same dream. They both wanted to build a house. Both men wanted to build a house. Now in the Bible, a house can refer to a number of things. As in this passage, a house can refer to your life. All of us want to build a life, a life that matters, a life that's significant, a life that is impactful, a life that you're proud of, a life that you're satisfied with, a life that is going somewhere. We want to build a life. Or in the Bible, building a house can re refer to building a family. Families are called a house in the Bible. We told about the house of David and the various other family structures. We talk about it today when we talk about our own homes. Nobody walks down the aisle pre-planning a divorce if they're serious. Nobody wants to live in constant conflict with their mate or with their offspring. No, we want to build homes that are stable and strong and vibrant because we want to build a house. Both men wanted to build a house. Or to build a house can refer to building a life, it can refer to building a family, or it can refer to building a church. After all, the church is called the household of faith. The temple was called the house of God. No pastor wants to see his church decline, wants to see people not changed and not Lost people not saved, saved people not discipled. They want to see growth and development and expansion, just as you have experienced here. Why? Because at Milestone, you're trying to build a house. Or to build a house can refer to building a life, building a family, building a church, or building a society. We're told about the house of Israel. That's the whole nation. We know about the White House, the house of Congress, we want to build a house in a defrayed, uh, afraid society. We don't want to see the conflicts politically and socially and economically and racially. We want to see a unified nation. We want to build a house. So both men wanted to build a house. The other comparison is both were listening to the same sermon. Jesus said both men heard these words of mine. So they were hearing the voice of the living word proclaiming the written word. It doesn't get any better than this. That means it was perfect orthodoxy. The word of God was going forth in perfection since Jesus could make no mistakes. They were hearing the voice. They were listening to what was said. They were in the same church at the same time listening to the same speaker about the same truth because both were hearing the word. They were listening to what was being taught in perfection. So both men wanted to build a house. They had the same dream. Both men were listening to the same truth. But both men were facing the same storm because it says a storm came. And the storm 
affected both of them. They were in reasonable proximity to one another because they were facing the same storm. Now, in the Bible, a storm is an adverse set of circumstances. A storm refers in scripture to negative things taking place in your world and in your life. It has been correctly said you're either coming out of a storm in a storm or headed toward a storm because life comes with storms. Jesus said in this world you will have tribulation. Life does get stormy. Sometimes in my mailbox, in your mailbox, you'll see a sign. It says occupant. Translation, we don't care who lives here. All you have to be is an occupant on the planet and it's going to rain. You just have to be here. Sometimes those storms are financial. Sometimes those storms are relational. Sometimes those storms are circumstantial. Sometimes uh, those storms are medical. When I came in 21, I just was a year into my storm of losing my father one month and my wife the next month. I was coming out of a storm. And the thing about storms is sometimes you just don't know they're coming your way. Because in life it rains. I would love to come here to tell you, follow Jesus and you don't get wet. Sometimes you don't know what wet is until you follow Jesus. So he says, both men had the same dream, listened to the same word. They were hearing the voice of God and they were facing the same storm. And many who are sitting here today have come to church in a storm. You've got that thing that maybe nobody knows about but you. And you're hurting because of it. You're wounded because of it. You don't know which way to go through it. And you're getting wet all over. Well, that's where the comparison ends. And the contrast begins. Because one man is called a wise man and the other man is called a fool. One man a wise man, one man a fool. Well, that tells us a lot right there. That means a wise man can have a dream and a fool can have a dream. That means a wise man can be hearing the word of Jesus and a fool can be hearing the word of Jesus. That means a wise man can be in a storm and a fool can be in a storm. So what made these two men different who were hearing the voice of God. Both men were hearing the voice of God. Yet one is called a wise man and the other is called a fool. It says, the wise man built his house on a rock, the fool built his house on sand. When you are building a house, where you start determines where everything else winds up because you build a house starting with the foundation. You start with pouring the cement on the structure you want to go on top of it. What made one man a wise man and one man a fool is because they started at different places. They didn't have the same, they had the same goal. They were listening to the same sermon they were having the same struggles, but they didn't start in the same place. In the Bible, wisdom is the ability to apply divine truth to life situations. In the Bible, a fool is the inability or refusal to apply spiritual truth to life scenarios. So hearing God's word had to do with what they did with it, not were they listening just to it. In other words, hearing the voice of God had to do with where they were starting, not merely what they wanted. For far too many people today, dealing with God is like placing an Amazon order. What they're wanting is what God can do with them, but they are not starting at the right place. They started at two different places. When uh, you go to downtown anywhere and you see them building a skyscraper, they cordison off the area. And then they dig a hole. You can always know how high they plan to go up by how low they drill down. 
You can't build a skyscraper on the foundation of a chicken coop because the chicken coop can't handle something that high. Many times we want skyscraper lives on chicken coop foundations and we wonder why things don't stand. There has been something gone awry with listening to the voice of God even when you've hear, heard it because both men heard the, ver, the word, the voice of God. Both men listened to his word. Now, sandy foundations are quick, are cheap, and they are easy. Rocky foundations are hard. They take time. They're going to cost more because you are setting a foundation. What made the difference between sand and rock so that what you hear matters? Let me say it another way. What turns hearing the word of God into hearing God from his word? Don't miss that. It's one thing to hear the word of God. Both men heard the word of God. They heard the voice of God. But one was a fool hearing the voice of God because the word he heard never became God to him. How do you make what you hear week after week, sermon after sermon, not only the word of God, but the word from God to you. So that what you hear matters and what you hear becomes transforming. He tells you, while both men heard the word of God, it says the one who built his house on the sand did not act on it. It said the one who built his house House on the rock acted on it. Let me say it another way. In order for the voice of God to become his voice to you, the word of God that you hear must become activated. God's word must be activated before it becomes active in your experience. If you hear the voice of God in whatever format that takes, certainly based on the truth of God, that goes unactivated, it will not be active even though you heard it. Now, most of you will not understand this illustration because you have to be African American to understand it. But I'm going to try to explain it the best way I can. A number of years ago, a hairstyle in the African-American community was called the jerry curl. It's a jerry curl. The jerry curl was quite an episode to get your hair to get curly and wavy and soft. See, most of y'all, it's natural. Ours, we, you got to do a little work on it. So you, 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 you went to the barber or to the beautician and you got these chemicals put in your hair, you got rollers put in your hair, and so it became wavy and curly and soft and it was called a jerry curl. And it was the in thing to do. The problem was that the jerry curl would often dry up. Your hair would get like dry. So whenever you got a jerry curl, you had to go to the store and buy curl activator. So that when, the, when your hair got a little dry, you sprayed the curl activator and your hair went bam, just, just came alive. God's word is true whether the book is closed or open. God's word is true whether you listen to it or not. Because it is the living word of God. But you need Bible activator in order for this word to become your word. The Bible will stay dormant in your experience even though it is not dormant in its reality 
until it is acted on. Only when you do something with what you heard does the word of God leave the paper of the Bible and gets written on the experience of the heart. This is why James 121 says, uh, receive the word implanted, which is able to save your soul. And then he goes on to say, don't be hearers of the word, but doers. God must see your feet before he activates what you heard into your life so that it becomes transferred into your experience in football. There is the NFL rule book. The NFL rule book applies equally to all 32 teams. All 32 NFL teams have the same rule book and have to play the game of football by the same rules. Something Dallas used to do. But they have to play by the same rules because they have a rule book. But every NFL team has their own playbook. The playbook is unique to each team. The teams don't share the same playbook because they got different players, different schemes. They've got different things. But they all have to operate by the same rule book. In the word of God, you have the divine rule book. That applies to all of us. But in our individual lives, we need our own playbook. The playbook is always going to be consistent with the rule book. It will never conflict with the rule book, but it will be applied differently in the playbook of your life. That's why you need God to speak to you from his word. You need to hear his voice, but you need to know that his voice is still consistent with the rule book that he has given. Many come to church to hear the rule book, but they never get their own playbook. And the reason why you don't get your own playbook is you've not acted on what came from the rule book. And if you don't act on what came from the rule book, you don't get your personal playbook. So the voice of God becomes generic and never gets applied to the plays in your life. And when things take place in your life, when you need a personalized uh, play, you just you need to know the rule book, but you need to be close enough to the rule book by your action that the Holy Spirit can give you your own private playbook, even if you have to call an audible in the last moment because you're so in touch with him, consistent with the rule book, he can tell you the playbook. Now, what people want is they want the benefit of the rock while playing with the sand. Sand is human opinion. It's man's thoughts. Jesus says in Matthew 15, verse 3, you do nullify the word of God by your traditions. In other words, you can cancel what God has to say out of the rule book in your experience because you incorporate human opinion that disagrees with the word of God. When you incorporate human opinion that disagrees with the word of God, you nullify its effect in your life. So when you hear the word, whether it's preached or read or however it is communicated, and you introduce to a sand, that is human opinion, you cancel out its personal benefit to you. You must act on it and not convolute it in order to get the privatized benefit from it. I, I remember, you know, I don't like apples. I, I don't like apples. I, I'm, a, I'm more of an orange banana guy. So I'm not into apples. I know apple a day keeps the doctor away. I know that and all that. But I'm just not into apples, except at the Texas State Fair. At the Texas State Fair, I'm into them apples because they're my candy apples at the Texas State Fair. Okay? So, so, so I, I like those apples. Now, those are apples dipped in liquid sugar. So they dip the apple in the liquid sugar, and I love those apples. But the problem is that once you dip the apple in the liquid sugar, you are, you are neutralizing the benefit that the apple was naturally designed to give you because you dipped it in liquid sugar. What many Christians do is they come to church and hear the word of God, then they dip it in human opinion. 
And once you dip it in secular thought and human opinion, you neutralize the natural benefit that it was designed to give. I was in a, uh, there's a camp that many of you, I'm sure, have gone to in East Texas, Pine Cove. And uh, I, I, we raised our children at Pine Cove. And Pine Cove was where I learned to ride a horse. I learned to ride a horse at Pine Cove. Now, I had seen enough Westerns to know what to do. I had seen Rawhide, The Rifleman, Gunsmoke, Bonanza. I had seen enough Westerns to know what to do. You know, you get on the horse, you go, ha, giddy up, kick it. You go, ha, giddy up, kick it. So, you know, so I got on my horse, got on my horse. I didn't need any help because I'd seen the Western. So I went, giddy up, ha, kick the horse. But I was on crazy horse. This horse had lost its natural mind. Because it would go two steps, then three steps back, then two steps forward, then three steps back. This, this horse is just going back and forth, back and forth. I called the wrangler over. I said, come, come here. I, this horse is crazy. I need another horse. He looked at me and he said, it ain't the horse that's crazy. I said, wait a minute, wait a minute. I'm, I, I'm going, ha, get up, kicking it. And the horse is going back and forth. He said, looked at me and he said, you can't go. Ha, giddy up, kick it while pulling back on the reins. You, you can't do it. You confuse this animal. He don't know which way you're going. And a lot of us say amen at church. Go secular on Monday and, and God don't know which way we're going. And we wonder why we're not making progress because the voice of God is not the foundation for all the decisions that are to be made and all the action that is to be taken. In order for the voice of God that you hear to become personalized to your benefit, our benefit in whatever the situation is, there must be an action taken that is not convoluted by the culture, by your race, by your gender, by your background, by your mama, by your daddy. There are two answers to every question. God's answer and everybody else's and everybody else is wrong. So whenever you disagree with God, you're wrong, they're wrong, because he can't be wrong. And the proof that you know he's right is that you act on it, which is why it's called walking by faith, not talking by faith, moving by faith, not mouthing by faith, leaping by faith, not just just communicating. You have to have motion. And once you've done that, you've personalized the truth. You've turned national news into local news because now God can apply it to you. He says... You know, I was in, in Italy, you know, um, there's a town called Pisa. There's only one thing in Pisa, the Leaning Tower of Pisa. There are two things in Pisa. The Leaning Tower of Pisa and people on the side of the road selling replicas of the Leaning Tower of Pisa. That's it. You know, people come from halfway around the world to watch a building do this. It's a leaning building. Now, a lot of people don't know why the Leaning Tower of Pisa leans. The Leaning Tower of Pisa leans because it's located in Pisa. Because Pisa means marshy. See, it wasn't built on a solid foundation. It's been leaning ever since. When I, I was over there, they had ropes around the base because it was leaning one twentieth of an inch every year. So they had to try to re-solidify the foundation so it wouldn't just be a tourist attraction. What God is saying is, I want you, if you're going to listen to my voice, I want you to establish my word as the foundation of your action, not merely of your biblical information. Don't be satisfied with hearing truth about God. You must hear truth about God, but he says the wise man not only heard the truth, the wise man acted on the truth. And when the wise man acted on the truth, it made the difference about the dream he had, about the word he heard, and about the storm he was in. Because we're told a storm came. Let's talk about this storm. Because it's described for us. He says that there was a storm that came. And when this storm, the wind blew, then the floods came and slammed against the house. So let's talk about the storm. When you got wind and flood that can tear a house down, 
We're talking about hurricane season. This is hurricane season. This is not like a mild rainstorm. This is wind that can knock a house down, flood the water coming up, rain that's coming down. This is hurricane season. But let me make sure I'm right. Anybody in here ever been in hurricane season? Okay. When, when it knocks your life over, when it unravels your existence, when it looks like it's destroying your mind, when it looks like you can't take another step, that's hurricane season. That's when all hell breaks loose and there aren't quick answers and you can't find God because he seems so far away. He says when the storm came, it was not clear who the wise man was and who the fool was until the storm came. See, as long as there was no storm, everybody looked wise because everybody was listening to the same voice. As you go through these six weeks of study and you're look, talking about hearing God, everybody's going to be hearing the same thing, but not everybody who hears the same thing will benefit to the same degree. Because it will be determined by what action is taken on the voice of God that everybody's hearing that will determine how much of the God who gave the voice is talking to you. We don't just need to hear the word of God, we need to hear a word from God. That is a relevant application of biblically authorized divine truth into our personal life situation. God wants to privatize and personalize his truth as he applies it to all. The story has one message. Your foundation determines your future. Where you start. Do you start with hearing God's voice and acting on it without convoluting it so that you can get personally benefited from it? Because without getting too deep into this, the job of the Holy Spirit is to privatize or personalize the truth of God to your situation. That's his job. His job is to make it true for you. It's true because it's true. But his job is to make it true for you so that you are experiencing its truth and not only learning it to quote it. You are learning it to experience. Experience it. He is the experiential one to make the voice of God heard in your heart so that it is God talking to you, not just talking to all. Jesus was on a boat one day and uh, in Mark 4, and he said to his disciples, let us go to the other side. That's what he said. Let us go to the other side. See a Galilee. Halfway across the Sea of Galilee, they run into a lilac. The Greek word lilac is a windstorm. The Sea of Galilee sits in a basin surrounded by large hills and mountains. And sometimes the wind would stir up and cause a disturbance. These are professional fishermen and yet they are terrified. So this lilac, this windstorm hits the Sea of Galilee and now these professional fishermen who've been fishing on this sea all of their lives are terrified. So their emotions, their theology, their well-being has been upended. They are physically afraid. They are emotionally insecure. And they got a lot of spiritual questions because they asked Jesus, Carest thou not that we perish? Because when you're facing a storm that can turn the boat of your life over, if the truth be told, you don't know whether God cares. You, you can feel that. You may know it academically and informationally, but when that storm hits and it's about to flip your whole world over, you raise the question whether you articulate it or not, where are you and do you not care? But Jesus is asleep on the stern on a my pillow. 
The Bible says he was asleep in the stern on a cushion. Now, if you're asleep in the stern on a cushion, you got a pillow up under you, that means you meant to go to sleep. You're not just nod, nodding. You didn't tuck that sucker up under your head and you are going to sleep on purpose. He was so asleep, they had to shake him to wake him up. It says they aroused him. They had, to, they, had to, they had to work at it to get it work up. He was sound asleep in a storm. They wake him up and Jesus says to them, why are you so timid? Now, I, I can hear Peter now. Oh, maybe Jesus, because we're getting ready to die. <laughs> I mean, why are we so timid? How can you sleep at a time like this? Our world is shaking. He says, oh, ye of little faith. I mean, what, do, what do you mean? I got reality here. I got reality. This boat is going to sink. We are going to die and we can't find you because you are asleep. So I don't understand. Why are you challenging my faith? He said, because before we left dry dock, I said, let us go to the other side. Not let us go halfway and not make it. Not let us go halfway and drown. Y'all were saying, amen, other side, other side, other side. Praise God for the other side. God is good all the time. All the time, God is good. You were amen in the sermon without paying attention to the truth. Because God will test whether you are paying attention to his word. He will allow situations and storms to see whether you retreat to what he said for your personal storm or will you ignore what he said in your personal storm. And then he says something in the storm. He says, peace be still. Why wouldn't he say storm be still? I'm in a storm. But he didn't say storm be still. He said, peace be still. In other words, if you're in my word based on my will, even though you're in your storm, you can get a pillow too. Because if you really believe my word, when you saw me get my pillow, you would have gotten your pillow because I told you we all going over to the other side. So you want to hear the word of God. You want to act on the word of God. You want to not convolute the word of God so that the word of God becomes his word to you. As the Holy Spirit takes it off the pages of the Bible and Xerox it into the experience of your life. When I was um, a boy growing up in Baltimore, in urban Baltimore, one Christmas, my father bought me a balloon punching bag. You hit it, boom! Boom! It hit the floor, bam, and then it bounced back, bing. You hit it, boom, it goes down, bam, and then it bounces back, bing. One time I kicked it, wham, it hit, it hit the wall, it came back, bam, 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 bing. No matter what I did to it, it just kept coming back. That's because it had a weight at the bottom that was heavier than the air at the top. So no matter what I did to it up here, down there determined where things wound up. Sometimes life goes boom. But if you are resting on the right foundation, you coming back, bing. Sometimes circumstances go boom, boom. And you may go, bam, bam, but if you're resting on the right foundation, you coming back, bing. And sometimes life gets so heavy and Satan gets so active that you're going, bam, 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 and you're just being tossed and turn, boom, 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 boom. Boom! But if you're resting on the right foundation, you're coming back. 